Okay. There we go. Ray, can can we can we uh, can, can I read about Manny's background? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Right ahead. So uh, absolutely, Renee. I did not introduce right. Emmanuel because okay, I knew you would do the best job. Well, thank you very much, uh, and Manny, thank you. Uh, while you listen to all of your wonderful uh, accomplishments here, uh, thank you all for waiting so patiently. So what I wanted to say is good afternoon and welcome to Conversations with Great Performers. And today we are truly, truly honored to have pianist Emmanuel Axe join us. A seven time Grammy Award winning pianist born in modern day Lvov, Poland, Emmanuel Axe began his piano students at the age of six with his father, I believe, as his first teacher. After living in Warsaw and also Winnipeg, Canada, Axe and his family moved to New York City, where he continued his studies at the pre-college division at the Juilliard School of Music. In 1970, Manny received his bachelor's degree in French at Columbia University and became a new uh, an American citizen. Shortly afterwards, he won the Young Concert Artists Award, and in 1974, captured public attention when he won the first Arthur Rubinstein International Piano Competition in Tel Aviv. At the age of 29, he received the coveted Avery Fisher Prize in New York City, and the rest is musical history. Performing all over the world with major orchestras, solo recitals and passionate about contemporary music, we are looking forward to Manny's appearances at the Tanglewood Online Festival this coming week. Emmanuel Axe is on the faculty of the Juilliard School and lives in New York with his wife, pianist Yoko Nozaki, and they have two children. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and holds honorary doctorates of music from Skidmore College, Yale and Columbia University. Please join me as we welcome pianist Emmanuel Axe. Hi. Hi. Hi there. Hi. <laughs> well, it's lovely to see you. Are we finding you in the Berkshires? Yes. Yes, we're uh, we're in West Stockbridge right now. In West yep. Stockbridge. Yep. How have you been managing during these last several months? Uh, well, it's been, it, it's, you know, for us, it's been fine. Certainly, it's been so hard on so many people, but we've, we've been very fortunate. Uh, I'm not traveling, obviously, but I am practicing and doing as much as I can to volunteer for some things. And uh, that's about all. So well, we're, we're really delighted to see you today. And thank you so much for, for your flexibility and your patience. Uh, I wanted to start by going back to your childhood. You grew up in Lvov and then Warsaw. I was wondering what your earliest childhood memories of music were. Well, basically I, I was like any other kid who started, who started playing. I just, I happened to like it. So I kept going. Uh, I don't think it was so different from, from anybody else really. Uh, I had very wonderful teachers the whole time. Uh, when I was young, they were, they were incredibly kind and serious at the same time. That's a very hard thing to do. That's why teaching anything is the hardest thing in the world. So uh, I've always admired teachers at any level. And, uh, you know, just I'm very grateful to the ones I had. Was your father your first piano teacher? Well, not really. He was a, he was a, a someone who loved music a lot, but I actually had a teacher who who taught the kids in the neighborhood. You know. I see, sense. I see. And you spoke Polish as a as a child, and I understand you still speak it at, at home. Uh, you moved well, to well, not, not anymore because my mom sadly is is gone. So oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but I have I have friends, of course, who speak Polish. So I still I still keep it up. Yeah. And then after you left Poland, you moved to Winnipeg, Canada. Uh, mm -hmm. You spent uh, some time there. And I understand that uh, you won what was probably your first competition there. Well, it wasn't really a competition. They had, uh, 
they had yearly sort of examinations. That's something they do nationwide in Canada. Mm -hmm. They do it in England as well. And, and you, you kind of, uh, uh, you play in your age group. And I guess I was a couple of age groups up, but uh, I did well in it. Nothing, nothing, very, nothing very urgent or important. Were you surprised when uh, you, you did so well? And it, I, wasn't, I wasn't really aware one way or the other. Uh, uh -huh. It uh -huh. was fine. <laughs> Good. I, I got dessert, I think, so that was very nice. <laughs> and uh, a little bit later, your family moved to New York City, where you began to attend the pre-college division at Juilliard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who, who were some of your teachers there, many? Uh, well, I had, a, I had a teacher for many years, Mieczysław Muntz, a Polish man, from the time I was 13 and a half or so until I was 25, same teacher. A uh, wonderful artist who stopped playing in the early 40s because of hand damage. The same, probably the same kind of thing that, that Gary Grafman suffered from and Leon Fleischer for many years. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and he, he had to give up playing, unfortunately, but he was still teaching. This well, is all very boring, I think. <laughs> you should probably... No, no. But, you know, it's interesting. Growing up in New York City, Philharmonic Hall had just opened in 1962. Was it a new world for you? Did you go well, to lots of concerts? It hadn't. I don't think it's open. It had opened yet. Uh, I think it was being built. I think it may have opened a little bit later. Or did I get that wrong? I, I think... I think what I, you read in the, new, in the computer. We'll have to ask Marty Bookspan, who's listening. No, well, yeah. I, you, you would know better than me. But of course, I haunted Carnegie Hall. That was that was where you heard all the great pianists, and I heard everybody multiple times. The best education in the world, hearing hearing the great masters. Which pianists did you particularly admire at that time? Well, I think we all we all pretty much worshipped uh, Rubinstein, Horowitz, uh, Richter, Gilles, Serkin. There was a whole a whole long list there's always been there's always been a huge number of wonderful pianists uh the ones that were most present i guess uh, for me as a child were probably rubinstein and horowitz but the great russians and, and of course the younger ones vladimir ashkenazi uh maurizio polini martha argerich you know these were all magical names so uh they they was, still are they still are and they still it was it yeah. was a great a great city to live in for a for a budding musician. Mm -hmm. Nothing nothing like it. Uh, I'll never forget waiting for hours and hours to get tickets for a Horowitz concert, and uh, it still is one of my my most favorite memories. Yeah. I I waited for an entire weekend, Friday night until Monday morning. There was a line outside Carnegie mm -hmm. for his return in 1965, and I was part of that line. It's an amazing. Ah, that's where I remember you from. <laughs> no, you, so, no, you wouldn't have been. You wouldn't have been old enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so moving on, I, you graduated from Columbia University. Yeah, I didn't really. I have to finish. I'm ashamed to say I didn't really graduate. I think I oh. owe three. I owe three credits. So they they had to make me legal down the road. They were very very kindly awarded me a degree uh, a few years ago. So now I, I'm, I was able to say to the president of the university, now I'm legal. <laughs> so that was good. But I, I took I was there for four years uh, and, and uh, majored in French. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then something happened. In 1974, there was a turning point in your life. You were 25 years old when you won the very first Arthur Rubinstein piano competition in Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. And I understand that Arthur Rubinstein was there. Was he a judge? Yes, he was the president of the jury, in fact. Oh, my. Yeah, yeah it was, of course, very special to, uh, to have him there. And, uh, yeah, it was, uh, of course, unforgettable, but, but also very very kind of heartwarming to meet him and and because of 
because of that, after the competition, he very kindly offered to, to hear me a number of times to, to give me some lessons. And so I, I had the chance to study a number of pieces with him, which was, of course, very, very special. And, and you know, this is a man who, who I think actually had met Brahms when he was three or four years old. I don't mean Brahms, I mean Rubinstein was three or four years old. Uh, and uh, the connection was just, was just amazing to, you know, to, to meet this, this great pianist who had, who had been part of, of the whole tradition of, of great music. Uh, so yeah, that was an amazing event. His uh, recordings of Chopin are certainly legendary. Uh, has yeah. he, he, has actually, his interpreter he played everything wonderfully. Uh, well, he was true. famous for Chopin because he was Polish, of course. But he played he played Brahms, Mozart, Beethoven, and all the moderns, his moderns, very brilliantly. You know, he knew he knew Ravel, and and uh, I I think probably knew Debussy and had you know played that music for him was like for us you know John Adams. So it was, uh, and you know, he he was uh, he was really an incredible part of of the history of piano playing. Did his recordings and interpretations of Chopin influence you in any way in your performances? I'm sure they did. You know, I'm I'm sure I you know I haunted his concerts. I had so many of his records. I'm sure that everything. Uh, Everything he did left a major imprint on, on my on my way of looking at music, but that was true of all the great pianists. You know, a lot of a lot of the things we hear, especially when we're young, that's what we try to sound like. And you can't really sound like that, which in a way is very good because you have to make it your own. You have to absorb it and make it your own. Uh, and that's what happens, but, but, but certainly the influence is very much there. You know, you said that entering a competition is like going to a 7-Eleven and buying a lottery ticket. Absolutely. What did you mean by that? Well, simply that all you can do is prepare very, very well, practice a lot, you know, do your very best, but you have to, first of all, have a good day. You have to be lucky and play well on that day. You have to have a large group of people that are particularly sympathetic to your way of playing because they may, they may think, yes, they may say, you know, he's, he's a very good pianist, but I just, I can't stand the way she plays. Uh, that's quite possible. Uh, and you know, you just have to be lucky enough to do well on the day and somehow for things to fall into place. It's, it's you know, it's like the rest of life. It's, it's not only music, it's, it's everything. You need a big slice of luck in life. The competition that really catapulted your career to fame was the Avery Fisher Prize. Well, that's when... not, a, of course, that's not a competition at all. Ah, not okay, at all. Explain, it. explain it to me. Simply, that's simply an award that's given an award. every an award that it's given every few years. Uh, I guess sort of for for a kind of achievement in the field. Uh, the first awards, Murray Pariah and Lynn Harrell got the first Avery Fisher Prizes back in 1972. Yo-Yo, my friend Yo-Yo got one in 78. I got one in 79. Uh, you know, it's kind of a, uh, Andre Watts had, has one, uh, Garrick Olson. It's, it's kind of, uh, Avery Fisher left a fund for this purpose. And, and it's an award, it's sort of an achievement award. It's like, uh, I don't know, an, an Oscar or an Emmy for, for music. I suppose, maybe not quite as significant or important, but it's important to us, you know? <laughs> well, you were 29 years old, which is really pretty young. Was that your moment of saying, you know what? I think I can have a career at this? Well, I think, 
I think again, uh, probably when when I when I did this competition in Israel, uh, that gave me some chances to perform, and from then I got I got some some re invitations. I, I think, of course, that that's one of the most important things in in a musician's life that. You try to play well the first time you get a chance to play somewhere and hope they'll ask you back. Uh, so again, you need some luck. You need, you need to be, uh, you need to play with a conductor that likes the way you play and, and to meet and, and have a good, uh, you know, that, that sort of thing. Again, it's a matter of luck, but of course you also have to work very hard and be prepared to do well when the opportunity comes. So I think by the time I was 29 or 30, I was kind of launched into a life of concert giving. Were your parents supportive of your career? They must have been thrilled when you won. Yeah, well, they were, you know, my mom was, was very much around. My father died when I was only 18. Mm, uh, sorry. Died, died in 1969 at a very early age. He was, uh, he was uh, 64 years old. Mm. Well, he, she, he and she had had a very... A very hard life, you know. They spent the war in uh, in Poland. They they were lucky to to come out alive. Uh, and my father, in particular, had a very very hard go of it. And my mother was indomitable. She lived to be almost one hundred and two. Wow! Quite, quite astonishing. And uh, uh, she had me very late in life. You know, in, in, in four four years after the end of the war. Uh, she would she would have been already 42 i think and at the time that was a very old age to have a child uh, so uh, she was yeah of course she was uh, she was thrilled to have me playing concerts and to be able to be there and to come to carnegie hall and to, <laughs> to enjoy all of that uh sure uh my dad unfortunately didn't didn't live to see me playing but he was very he was very, they were both very supportive of what I wanted to do, of course. That's wonderful. How proud they must have been. That's just wonderful. You know, you have won seven Grammy Awards. You've been nominated, I believe, 18 times. And you still practice. You still practice a lot. Tell me about your practicing. Uh, there's not much to do. There's not, not much to say. I, I get up in the morning, I go to the piano, and I... Uh, I start working. <laughs> not, not you really. Do a lot much. of scales and arpeggios still? Or? No, sc no scales and no. arpeggios. No, just, uh -huh. I just practice what I'm playing. Uh huh. Uh, I see the piano is behind you. Can you tell us about your instrument? Well, this is just a normal Steinway size B. Uh, we have one here and I have one in, in New York. Uh, it's very nice. It's black. Uh, it has white keys and black keys. It has uh, the usual of them. three, 88. 88. Yeah, at least the last time I counted. <laughs> Although my wife, who's also a pianist, she grew up in uh, in Durham, North Carolina. Her mother was a piano teacher, uh, and she had an old Steinway that had eighty five keys. Oh, really? So, uh, so the last three were added. I don't know at what point. Uh, but yeah, it's just a, it's a, it's a very nice, very nice looking piano and just normal. <laughs> now, you are a Steinway artist. Can you explain to us what that means? Uh, I think what it means essentially is that if I come to a city where for some reason the concert hall has a piano I don't like, which is not a Steinway or there is no Steinway, they will find the piano and bring it uh, at a cost, but they will bring it. <laughs> so, do, you find, do, do you find that there's a difference in touch or action between the German Steinway and the American Steinway? Oh, def definitely. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, there's not really supposed to be a difference because essentially the, 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 the patents and the building system is supposed to be the same. And in fact, the German, the German action, which was, I think, built by a man named Renner. I mean, that's the, that's the factory that supplies that particular thing, the keys and the, and the hammers, uh, is often used in an American Steinway. 
but I think it's it's the wood, the material, and and you know a lot of little things that are different, and it probably adds up to a difference. So uh, I think in in it, it's 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 a different feeling instrument. But of course, there are also many many differences between individual pianos. You know, so you have an American Steinway. Uh, at Symphony Hall in Boston is not at all the same as the American Steinway that's at Carnegie Hall. They're very different pianos. Uh, the German Steinway that's at Symphony Hall in Boston is very different from the Carnegie Hall German Steinway. So the, the variations, I would say the variations within pianos are just as great. Is there a difference when you play on ivory keys versus the plastic keys? I don't think so. I, I think that's a myth. Um, mm -hmm. No, there was a lot of talk about that, but I, I wouldn't, I certainly couldn't tell by feel. I might be able to tell by looking because the ivory ones will have a crack sometimes, mm -hmm. but otherwise, no, I, I, I can't tell. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, you've concertized all over the world. Uh, I know many, many times we've enjoyed hearing you at Tanglewood. Do outdoor venues present some challenges for you? Well, there, you know, you try not to think about it too much. Of course, Tanglewood's quite special because mm -hmm. there are there are really no uh, there are no acoustical aids in that shed. Mm -hmm. It's just, there's a roof and the sides are open, but the sound is surprisingly wonderful. Uh, you know, it was built in in the '40s, I believe, with with very little scientific input as compared to what's happened now with acoustics and you know the amount of the amount of testing and the amount of technological advancement that's happened but it sounds marvelous it's it's still probably the best outdoor venue uh, but people are doing amazing things you know the hollywood bowl of course is is now enhanced with so much uh modern research that the sound there is is superb and i i think that's that's one of the great advances in in technology the the, the field of acoustics um talking about technology I, I understand that uh in you occasionally use technology called tonara uh yes to I've used, practice I've used tonara, that's so yes. interesting to me yes can you Tonara, talk a little bit about that? Well, Tonara is a system that was designed in Israel by, by, and actually the one I communicate was a wonderful pianist and also a very brainy guy. <laughs> and what it does is, you, you know, when you have uh, the screen on an iPad, you now can, of course, have music on the iPad and you can either swipe or use a pedal to turn the pages. Now, Tonara, if you program it properly, he so far is the one that does the programming. I don't know how to do that, but it'll turn the pages for you. <laughs> so as you're playing, I think it takes in the notes that you're playing and it flips the page when it's time to flip the page. Uh, thank goodness, it doesn't really take wrong notes into account. <laughs> so it still turn the page, which is very comforting. Uh, but I've used it. I've used it to play uh, uh, recitals. Uh, two years ago, I did a Bach Partita, which was a new piece for me. I just didn't dare play without music, uh, and I was able to use this and and play. And it, it turned for me. Thank goodness. Oh Absolutely. my! Yeah, well, that's, one, that's wonderful invention. I'm I'm sure someday it'll be the the standard. You know. Uh, you know, I was thinking about all of the performances of the of concerti that we have listened to you perform and the relationship between uh, conductor and soloist is always one that interests me. How do you communicate with a conductor when you're performing? Well, it depends on the person, of course. If it's us, I get along with almost everybody and uh, I basically, see what the orchestra sound, I try to get what's happening on the stage from them and respond to it. 
And I hope that the same thing is happening in the other direction. So it's really a matter of, of uh, I think, listening and responding, like a conversation. A conversation. Yeah. That's, a, that's a good way to, to look at it. Do you have conversations with the conductor prior to the performance? And oh, sure. What happens, what happens if you have a disagreement? I don't think that that I don't think that happens very often. Uh, That's great. I, I think simply because uh, there are so many ways to to play a piece of music that if you if you respect the other person, if you like each other, there's no reason to have a fight about anything. You just say, "Oh, you want to do it this way? Fine." It's very straightforward. You know, our dear friend Marty Buxpan uh, told me the story of Rudolf Serkin who was performing the Brahms second piano concerto and in his athleticism during the second movement, he broke the pedal during uh, a performance. Have you had any mishaps like that? I think I've been very lucky. I, I haven't, uh, nothing, nothing too terrible has happened. Uh, I've, I've, I've broken a string maybe once or twice, I think. You know, and then you just kind of, when there's a pause, you go up and you move the offending string away so it doesn't jangle and keep going. Uh, that's, that's about all. Otherwise, no, not really. Happy well, to say. I hope to keep it that not, way. Not on wood, absolutely. Yeah. By the way, I, I meant to say the second movement. Uh, how, how interesting that uh, they were able to repair the piano uh, during what turned out to be an 18 minute intermission. Do you have oh. a, <laughs> do you have a favorite concerto? Not really, no, no. There are too many, too many great pieces in, in our world to pick any one, no. Mm -hmm. Well, on uh, August 1st at 8 p.m., listeners will be treated to a Tanglewood online performance of the Beethoven Cello Sonata Number no. 3 in A Major with Yo-Yo Ma. And uh, you have collaborated with Yo-Yo many, many times. How did that first begin? Uh, we met, well, we've been playing together for 48 years. 48 years. Yeah. And we met, I think, about 51 years ago. You know, I was, uh, I'm 71 now. And I think I met Yo-Yo when I was 19. And he was, I guess, 15 or, or something. And, and uh we just, we became friends, you know. We we liked each other. Uh, he was, of course, already very very well known in musical circles. Uh, he was he was a true prodigy, you know. And he's become, of course, one of the great great uh, artists in the history of of the cello. But uh, even then, everybody knew about him and and. Uh, I worked for his teacher. I worked for Leonard Rose uh, as the studio pianist, you know, uh, accompanying the lessons. And I met Yo Yo. We hit it off. Uh, we liked each other. A few years later, we wound up with the same management company. And so we asked if they would uh, if they would put us together for a couple of concerts. And it's been going ever since. So I've had the pleasure many times of uh, having a stage seat at Ozawa Hall where I'm overlooking your shoulder and you always look like you're having such a great time with each other you're smiling you're, yeah, you have a well, twinkle in your eye yeah we love we love being together we love working together and I think one of the one of the nice things about our lives is that we're able to go and do some stuff on our own and so whenever we see each other it's it's a wonderful thing. It's like, it's, it's great to be together again. And uh, each time it's, uh, it's a little, it's, yeah, it's, it's a vacation. <laughs> it's wonderful. You've done quite a lot of recordings as well. Do you play differently for the microphone? Uh, I think, I think you make the adjustment pretty much without thinking. In other words, you'll play and hear the first take, and then you realize what you have to do to adjust to what the microphone's picking up. I think it is different. Yeah, it's a, 
but but it's not something that you do you don't do every detail consciously it's a you kind of adjust you might change a couple of things consciously but you also make an unconscious adjustment just from listening back you know this has been um an unprecedented couple of months mm. um we we lost um peter serkin sadly to pancreatic cancer and i remember speaking with him how do you get through this you perform you rehearse, you record, and how, how, how does music get you through this? And Peter responded by saying that music is his friend. It's always there. Mm -hmm. how, how do you feel about that? Well, you know, Peter, Peter and I were very good friends. Mm. We, we talked very often on the phone. We saw each other when he was in Tanglewood, he, you know, he used to live in this, in this area, uh, in Richmond. And we saw each other regularly, uh, a few times a week during the summer. Uh, he was, aside from being one of the greatest artists I, I ever had the privilege of meeting, he really was so devoted to to the idea of music being a truly important, important thing in everyone's life. He really believed in that. You know, so, so for him, it was, was his, uh, was his religion, you could say, as it is for me. You know, I'm not, I'm not a religious person. I don't think he was. This is our religion. <laughs> so. Well, we miss him, and uh, oh I, yes, we all miss. Him. We've been we've been collecting some uh, some some stories about him and some some interviews with people. And with any luck, that'll be on the air soon. Oh, that'll be wonderful. That'll be wonderful. You know, it, it's interesting. Uh, I read a statistic, according to the internet, that in China there are forty million piano students. Yeah, and yet in the United States there are only six million piano students what do you attribute that to well six millions <laughs> first of all uh, well clearly western music at least uh, piano playing has really captured the imagination of of the chinese uh and and chinese kids uh very frankly i think that has a lot to do with people like Lang Lang and people like Yuja Wang and of course people like Yo-Yo. I think Lang Lang has done unbelievably wonderful and important work, you know, for, for young people in, in China. I, I, so I think, I think it's, it's a wonderful thing. I don't know. It's hard to imagine the entire population of France playing the piano. You know, it's really a lot of people, <laughs> but but it, look, in, in the ideal world, everybody would play an instrument a little bit. Just the way, for me, this is, this is my, my feeling about it. You know, you, you'd, like, you'd like everyone to be able to bounce a basketball or throw a baseball. Uh, do a addition and subtraction, you know, know a little bit about science, and do some music. Just, it doesn't have to be, you know, they don't have to play Chopin etudes. Uh, just, I, I, I would love to think that it's part of everybody's toolkit, you know, and, and uh, I, think we're, I think we're doing better now than we were 25 or 30 years ago because i think what's happened is that the the general education system in the u.s has changed a great deal uh when i was a kid in in new york every public high school had an orchestra actually you know you could uh, they don't not not a good orchestra but people were playing you know or or you had a band or something and I think that's not as true as it used to be. What I think is happening now is that organizations 
based in music conservatories, organizations that are connected to orchestras are doing their part in helping the education system. I think, I think we need to take up the slack. And I think that's happening more now than it was. And I, I hope it'll continue to get bigger and bigger. You know, there's a, it, it's, it's now Carnegie Hall now, for example, has an, an entire education wing. Half the building is devoted to educational projects from, from little kids, you know, from four-year-olds all the way up to professionals. And that's a wonderful thing. And I, I think that's true of, of most, uh, most big organizations now. Well, let's hope so. Let, yeah. Let's hope so. Of course, uh, we have right here in the Berkshires, Kids for Harmony. You know, yes, the, exactly. And uh, programs such as Elsie's Demo, absolutely. Yes, yes they're, they're, they're revolutionizing. They're, that has been such an inspirational program to the whole world, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a remarkable achievement. I was, I was in Caracas uh, many years ago now, I guess it would be more like 15 years when when Gustavo Dudamel was just beginning to be the conductor of the Simon Bolivar Orchestra and they came over for their first American tour and I was lucky enough to be the soloist with, with that with that orchestra uh, so I was in Caracas then I came again a couple of years later what you saw with with the kids there was just incredible the, the level of the level of participation and the teachers and and the enthusiasm and i think that's inspired a lot of things in this country you know before we turn this over to megan wilden for a short question and answer uh, i did want to ask you a few things for instance i found out that uh, you co-constructed the april 19th 2017 new york times crossword puzzle <laughs> Not all of it. <laughs> no, I was put together with with a with a constructor who also who also likes music. So we we were we connected, you know, on on email. But it was a project that I I think it was the seventy fifth anniversary of the crossword, of the Times crossword, and I'm I try to do them every day, uh, and I guess I wrote I wrote once to Will Shorts querying one of the quotes one of the one of the clues and he wrote he wrote back uh saying no you're you're wrong about that he of course was right but he did ask are you the one who plays the piano i said yes and he said we're doing this 75th anniversary where we're asking people who are not normal constructors to do some parts of constructing and would you be interested i said of course <laughs> you know so I got to do it. Yeah, it was a tremendous thrill. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, you do so much traveling uh, and uh, concertizing. What do you do when you're not traveling? How do you spend your time? Uh, I get well. I guess now that my fam, now that the kids are not with with us, you know, when we have the grandkids, I'm busy. When we don't, I I practice. Uh, I I'm a sports nut. You know, I watch, uh, I follow tennis very closely. So when there are tournaments, I, I love watching all of them. Uh, and I'm a football fan. <laughs> so that's, that's what I do. do. Do your kids or your grandchildren play music? Uh, my son and my daughter both studied. Didn't really take to it. But they did study for a while. Uh, so... In conclusion, uh, do you have any suggestions? Are you optimistic about the future of classical music, Manny? Well, big question. I mean, of, <laughs> of course, I'm optimistic because I, I like music. I, I think there's still, there's still a lot of people to do. Uh, so I would like to think that, that uh, this will continue, you know, on into the future. Uh, I think we're definitely going to see live concerts again. Mm. Uh, simply because I think people would like to be together witnessing an event. I, I don't think it's particular only to, to music. You know, it's when, 
when the Super Bowl is on, you could sit at home and get 36 cameras to give you a close-up of everything, including replays and so forth. But there's still no tickets available for the Super Bowl. Everybody wants to go. And I think, I think we are naturally, the, the, the human being is naturally gregarious. I think we'd like to be with other people witnessing something enjoyable. So I, I think there will be gatherings again. I hope, I hope they come soon. Uh, I, I certainly look forward to playing for people that, that I can see and that can see me and where we can connect, you know, without necessarily the barrier of, of the, of the, uh, of the Zoom link. But on the other hand, when I think of, of how amazing it is that we have all this technology, uh, can you imagine if, if this happened, if, if this was going on and there was no way to connect to anybody? You know, not to be able to speak to your children or your grandchildren or your friends, or, or, or to listen to things, or to watch a movie, or we're so privileged. We're so or lucky. Uh, or, you yes, know, just, or, just to be able to, to teach and continue. Sure, sure, sure. absolutely. I, I, I think in that sense, we're living in a miraculous age. Mm -hmm. We're fortunate to have this. Uh, anyway, that's... But but I, I hope it'll I hope it'll be over, you know, in, in as short a time as possible. Most of all, I hope people are keeping safe and are following what you know are doing what they should be doing to keep themselves and others safe. Well, we have been so grateful to spend this time with you. You've been so generous. And we only wish you the very, very best of Thank good you. health and happiness and Thank many, you. many more concerts uh, throughout okay. the world. Uh, certainly we hope we'll see you here at Tanglewood uh, very soon. I, I hope and, so too. Uh, we just Thank you so much for doing this for the Berkshire community. I'll turn it over to Megan Wilden for just a short Q&A and again, all the very, very best. Thank you so much, Renee. Thanks a lot. You bet. Okay. Thank you, Renee. Um, so we have some questions from the audience uh, that okay. came in through webinar chat. So I'll read them to you. Uh, the first is from Francis. I believe it's Francis Spina. Um, he says, what pieces do you play most often and why? For example, is it because you like the piece or is it because the audience likes the, likes the piece? Uh, well, it has a lot to do, uh, when I play concertos, it has a lot to do with what the the conductor and the orchestra have planned. Uh, probably, I probably do Beethoven and Mozart more than other composers, but also for me in particular, I do quite a lot of the Brahms concertos. Uh, for solo music, oh, I do pretty much what I want to, and it, it's a different program every year. It's hard to pick anyone in particular, so. That's great, and um... You may have addressed this, but does a particular make of piano lend itself to a more satisfying performance of particular pieces or composers? Did you, uh, did you I talk usually, about that already? I'm so sorry. I, I usually make friends with, with most pianos. I'm not, I'm not uh, crazy on the subject. And as long as it's good, you know, some are, some are a little harder to play, some are a little lighter. Uh, some are more brilliant, some less, but as long as it's decent and has a, has a decent sound and a decent action, I'm usually okay. So I kind of adjust to the instrument. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so in uh, Louise comments, we really enjoyed hearing about your early background. And Joan asked, you get together with other great pianists. If so, what do you talk about? Football or piano or oh, both? <laughs> oh. Actually, well, I have a lot of pianist friends, yeah. And uh, when I talk to them, sometimes it's very particular. You know, I'll ask, look, which finger do you use for this note in this measure? You know, because I, I rely on them to help me out with this kind of stuff. Uh, sometimes we, talk, uh, we spend a lot of time discussing pianists that we really love. 
you know, things we've heard on YouTube, you know, so did, you, did you hear this Ignaz Friedman recording from 1936? Let me send that to you. Or I just heard this amazing young pianist that you've got to catch. And so that, and, and we tell each other jokes. Uh, and of course we, we discuss food. Uh, restaurants are a big subject because we travel mm -hmm. a lot and, uh, you know, it's an important part of life. <laughs> so, yeah. Especially if you travel. So, um, let's see, somebody, uh, Ben asked, didn't you play in a chamber concert at Ozawa with Yo-Yo Ma when there was a wild thunderstorm that made the lights go out? Yes, and yes. And what was that like for you? We remember that program very, very well because we were, it was quite funny because it was, it was the Schumann E-flat quartet. There was a first half that was played by Yuri Bashmet, the viola player, with his daughter playing Shostakovich Sonata for viola. And we were terribly nervous because he only arrived that day and we rehearsed the, the Schumann really just before the concert. So we didn't know what was going to happen. You know, we were kind of, we walk out on stage and as we started, it, it went, the, the, the skies went completely crazy. Thunder, lightning. I mean, I was sitting at the piano. Yo-Yo was five feet away from me. I could barely hear him. Wow. And, and so we were, in a way, we don't know how the performance was. We were saved by the storm. But it's funny that people, that's what people remember about that concert. I don't think they remember much about the actual playing because you couldn't hear much. So, but we, we remember that concert very well. Yeah. 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 I and remember that, that concert before. too. I'm sorry? I remember that concert too. The doors yeah. of Ozawa were going up, opening and shutting yeah. and opening and shutting. Yeah. It was wild. Yeah, it wow. was an insane evening, yeah. Wow. Um, so, uh, um, Louise asks, can you spell Tanaro? She says she uses four yes. for, on an iPad for sheet music, so she's really interested yeah. in that. Right, T-O-N-A-R-A. -A. And you can look, I think it's tonara.com. You can look it up. I don't know how readily available it is, but certainly she should look for that. T oh. T O N A R A. Oh, okay, perfect. I, in, case, in case for some reason it doesn't respond to com, you might try tonara dot co dot i l for Israel. I don't I don't know for sure, but I think probably com is fine. Okay, wonderful. And um, Kathy asks, on average, how many hours do you practice in a day? Probably around four, something like that. Wow, wonderful. And Francis, who I, believe, who I know is a dedicated pianist, and he's also a former uh, state Supreme Court judge. Oh. Uh, and now he's retired, so he just gets to play piano. Francis, I hope I have it right. He wanted to know which pianists most affect your playing and why or how. Well, I, it's, it might be a bit of an amalgam, but the, I think probably Rubinstein was the most influential because I heard him so often in New York from the time I was 13 till I actually met him when I was 25. Uh, and he was such a, he was such a sane pianist, you know, he was, Hor Horowitz, for example, was, was so incredibly brilliant, but you couldn't, you couldn't imagine, unless you were him, I don't know how you could imagine playing like that. It just, but with Rubinstein, you could actually, you could use that as a model and just say, I would like to play like that, but the hard part is playing like that, playing it as well as he did. That was the problem, really. <laughs> so he didn't, he didn't, he didn't do crazy things, you know. He was a, and maybe that appealed to me very much because 
I, I loved Horowitz, you know, I, I loved Richter. There were, I loved Gillels, who was also a very sane, great pianist. But Rubinstein was always so natural and, and so, at the same time, so exciting and so, uh, yeah. I, well, I, I can't, you know, I could use every adjective in the world, but well, anyway, you, probably him. <laughs> so in our, our last question, because I know you need to practice. Yeah, I need uh, to. <laughs> and it's from Martin, and he says, how do you plan for and approach master classes? You know, I don't, I don't do them very often. Uh, and I think the most, com the most important thing to do in a mass in a class situation like that, with people listening is to make the person feel comfortable to say something positive and to say maybe one or two things they probably have already heard from their teacher but it's like a reinforcement you know i i always when i say something i'm i'm almost always sure that they have been already told that by their teacher. But sometimes it's like a parent talking to you. You know, you don't really take it in, but if somebody else says that, that you remember, <laughs> you know? And it doesn't help when the dad says, yeah, you know, I've told you that for years. Yeah, but that's different. <laughs> so it's kind of the same sort of thing. But, but to be positive, to make people comfortable and, and to do no harm is the most important thing. Absolutely, thank you. Two more questions snuck in, is that okay? Or, okay, and then uh, then that's really it. Uh, from um, Marilyn and Ellie Katzman, have you ever considered conducting? No, no, <laughs> I one of the, I'm one of the two pianists alive now who don't conduct. <laughs> Radu okay, Lupu is the other one, I think. <laughs> Great. And then uh, from Kathy, is there such a thing as a Russian style in playing? You know, that's, I, I don't think so. I think there's a Russian, there's a Russian tradition in that every Russian pianist that I know, you know, every good Russian pianist has a fabulous ability at the piano. They, none of them have any difficulties. It's just, it's all just there. And then I think, then I think you're talking about variety, especially now. Uh, I think to some degree, the repertoire, the music they play conditions the Russian tradition, which is they will play a lot of Rachmaninoff, a lot of Prokofiev, a lot of Skriabin. That's their music. You know, the way, the way probably people who are born in Germany will play a lot of Beethoven, a lot of Schumann, uh, but it's by no means exclusive in any way. You know, one of the, probably one of the greatest pianists uh, for Schumann, the, in my experience, is Vladimir Sofronitsky, who never even came to the U.S. He's pure Russian, so, you know, has very little to do with, with nationality. Uh, the tradition's not really national based, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Garrick Olson, for example, is very much in the tradition of Russian piano playing, but that's because he was born in White Plains, New York, and he mm -hmm. had Russian teachers. You know, so it, it doesn't matter where you where you live. What matters is what your what your line is. Sure. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. We know you have a very busy schedule despite the quarantine and you've got some upcoming online performances. Is that right? Yeah, we've taped, we've taped a couple of things that are going to be on the Tanglewood. Oh, wonderful. So we can all look for that. Yeah. And uh, so thank you again. And thank you, Renee right. Rota, for organizing this wonderful um, uh, series of conversations with great performers like Emmanuel. And thanks, everybody else. We'll be back next Thursday morning at 10 a.m. And Renee, who will be our guest next week? Well, actually, it's going to be a very exciting uh, week because it will be uh, a salute to Martin Buxband's 94th birthday. We'll be speaking with broadcaster Brian Bell. Great. We look forward to that. So thanks again, and everyone have a wonderful weekend. Thank you Bye -bye. so much. Let's say goodbye and leave. <laughs> yes.
Bye bye. bye. Thank you. Thank you all. And thanks for everyone's patience. Thank you, Renee.